The War Against Women by Marilyn French, part one, continued. Political Discrimination. Historians call ancient Athens the seat of democracy because it was the first state to establish a system allowing all citizens to vote. But only about 6% of the population were citizens. Women and slaves could not be citizens, and law kept women in near slavery. We are taught that the political revolutions of recent centuries have advanced democracy, that more people have a voice in government than in the past. This may be true, although most contemporary democratic systems mask the fact that the real power in the state is held by anonymous men who run huge corporations and important institutions. In any case, democratic rule, supposed rule by the people, the citizens of a country, never included women at all until this century. Discussions of women and political power often confuse two very different situations. An extraordinary woman coming to power as an individual is in a mainly male govern governing establishment and political power held by women as a caste, women in general. Hmm. They're hyphenated. Since the rise of the state, no state has ever allowed women in general to have a voice. But women could rule in many systems, especially monarchies. The first states were ruled by a single man supported by his clan who appropriated the production and sometimes the land of those they dominated. But men in clans were surrounded by women, mothers, wives, sisters, concubines, and slaves. Within families, women matter, hold personal as opposed to formal power, and often rise to power. Most have held power behind the scenes, influencing the male ruler or acting as regent for an underage male ruler but many ruled directly in their own right, from the earliest Sumerian and Japanese states to the monarchies of medieval Europe. But most ruled along the male model. Elite women may hold political power without any change in situation of women as a caste. They do not speak in women's voice. That is because where they can hold power, women rulers are women only incidentally, seen as extraordinary able to overcome the weaknesses of their sex. Nevertheless, all are subjected to special attack because of their sex. The Chinese blamed emperor's concubines for the fall of dynasties. It may be ironic that a woman, Indira Gandhi, ruled a nation that more than any other kills its females, but the two factors are unrelated. That Indira Gandhi Golda Meir or Margaret Thatcher held power does not mean their countries have less contempt for women than others. Today, women usually come to power in countries with traditions of inherited rule. Elite men may allow women of their own country class um, may allow women of their own class to hold power if they have the potential to unify a country counting on their being malleable to male control, as Indian Congress Party mem mistakenly thought Indira Gandhi and Israeli Labor Party men thought Golda Meir. Whether or not such women defer to male control, men can usually count on them to uphold class interests. Women need servants more than men do, 
not having wives, and they know they govern by men's sufferance. India elects more women to top political posts than other countries because it has a tradition of rule by an elite linked by blood. It is still a feudal nation. Few monarchies remain, but countries ruled by elites that are clans, extended families, within which women can hold influence, run on similar principles. In India, caste distinctions are of huge importance and difficult to overcome. In 1990, there was a larger percentage of women in the lower house of India's parliament, 7.9%, than in the American House of Representatives, 6.4%. Women comprise 9 to 10% of Indian upper house, the Indian upper, but only two out of 100 US senators are women. Economists Amartya Sen notes that more women were tenured at Delhi University than at Harvard, where Sen teaches now. However, as the Indian caste system gradually erodes and becomes less constricting, elite women will no longer be privileged over lower class men. Indeed, fewer women of this generation have important government jobs than in the first generation after independence. In both governments and economic institutions, as supposed merit succeeds blood as a standard, systems become more impersonal and more male dominant. Women have the least access to power in systems supposedly based on merit, where rank is earned, not inherited. This is not as some men claim because women are less competent but because they are foreclosed from the avenues by which it is earned. In system controlled by male cliques, military oligarchies, or so-called democracies, rank is earned by a military combat service, which excludes women, work experience, or political experience, from both of which women are largely excluded. When educated men began to have a voice in Europe in the 14th century, women were forbidden to attend most universities, and few had even a rudimentary education. Simply by this simple, single exclusion, men kept women out of political and religious life and all professions except midwifery. They soon barred midwives as well, or burned them. Today, women are educated in most industrial countries and can work in a variety of, but not all, areas. But male superiors, reluctant to advance them, rarely place women on a track to higher office. In non-industrial or developing countries, women hold about 6% of government posts. In most European nations, they hold 5 to 11%. But in 1989, the Interparliamentary Union reported that the percentage of women in the world's legislatures had fallen. In 1975, at the outset of the UN Decade for Women, women made up 12.5% of the world's parliaments. In early 1988, 14.6%. But by 1989, they had dropped again to 12.7%. Women's voice is being voided in newly emerging Eastern European states too. Top government posts in Hungary and Romania are held exclusively by men. In Poland, a woman was Minister of Culture in Tadeusz Matsowiecki's cabinet, but Lech Walisa has not appointed even one. 
On the other hand, many women occupy high political positions in the Scandinavian countries, in some tiny countries like Dominica and the ne Netherlands Al Antilles. Gro Harlem Brundtland has several times functioned as Prime Minister of Norway, and several states have female presidents, a largely honorary position. A Norwegian Research Institute commissioned a study called Scenario 2000 to delve into the causes of this seemingly feminist shift. Norway is, in my experience, one of the most feminist countries in the world. Men as well as women support equal rights, at least in principle. But the scholars, business executives, and politicians involved in the study suggested that one reason women were gaining prominence in public life was that men were leaving it. Like the American men who ruled New England Protestant churches when church and state were unified, but deserted in large numbers, leaving religion to the women when capitalism opened a route to greater power. Norwegian men are deserting the fairly narrow field of Norwegian politics for the more profitable and powerful transnational corporations. The report concluded, women may be moving from a marginal minority to a marginal majority. This is not yet the case in the United States where as of 1990, two women sat in the 100 seat Senate and there were 29 women out of 435 representatives, 6%. Here, in the heartland of feminism where we are told women rule men, women have less voice in government <coughs> than in non-industrial countries. In 1986, 151 women held posts in state cabinets, 17.9%. In 1990, three women won governorships in the 50 states. They won 18% of state legislature seats. 54 hold state executive offices. It could be worse. In April 1990, men in the Swiss canton of Appenzell, Inner Roden, voted to continue to bar women from voting at all. Moreover, the few women who do operate in the public realm are subjected to a kind of attack rarely leveled at men. Although the first black mayor of New York City, David Dinkins, has come in for criticism of his dress and manner, but not his sexuality. When Margaret, Margaret Thatcher was prime minister of Great Britain, journalists regularly impugned her sexuality, her husband's virility, read dominance over her. Read and criticized her dress and manner. Yet she was the most extraordinary world leader of her time. While criticism of Margaret Thatcher's policies was legitimate, such personal attacks function forcibly to remind female leaders that they are under the constant surveillance of men who will pounce on any move to alter government policy toward women. It is doubtful if a strongly feminist woman could win major political office in any nation, but even if Golda Meir, Indira Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher, or later, Benazir Bhutto, had had the inclination to ease women's lot, they would not have dared to do so. With a few exceptions, only male leaders dare to eliminate laws constricting women. Men's hatred for women in the public realm extends even to the wives of political leaders. Barbara Bush escapes criticism by presenting herself as motherly. Pat Nixon was the object of considerable sympathy in later years. But when her husband was president, journalists attacked her for brittleness. Wives who are perceived as having minds that might influence <coughs> their husbands come in for worse attacks. Come in for the worst attacks. Journalists spewed contempt at Rosalind Carter an intelligent, dedicated, and hardworking partner to President Jimmy Carter. They viciously stabbed Nancy Reagan for her taste for luxury, her weight, and her clothes, but hated her for her influence on her husband, which seems to have been mainly positive. For instance, she opposed his going to Bitburg and wanted him to restrain CIA Director William Casey. 
being far more serious than Nancy Reagan, does not exempt Raisa Gorbachev from a check. Soviet men resent her assertiveness and style. A deputy in a government forum even attacked her on primetime television, asserting falsely that Napoleon was tempted into tyranny by sycophants and his wife. He accused Mikhail Gorbachev of showing imperialist tendencies because he too was incapable of avoiding the adulation and influence of his wife. The Obliteration of Women from History One way men perpetuate women's exclusion from political life is by obliterating evidence of their participation in public affairs. Men close ranks to appropriate women's projects or attribute them to men. Male historians present a united front in omitting women from all kinds of history. Few people know about the many female rulers, philosophers, scientists, artists, writers, and inventors of the past. This shit is like all dirty. It's like so cloudy. I think I got like coconut oil on it. I don't know how to even clean it. Windex? Few people know about the many female rulers, philosophers, scientists, artists, writers, and inventors of the past, yet some were highly influential and many contributed to human knowledge and well-being. We cannot remedy this lack here, but we can describe a recent case in which women founded a very important organization only to be thrust out of it and their record expunged. The organization was Poland Solidarity, which was begun by two women. Mm -hmm. Anna Walentinovitz joined the Lenin shipyard in Gdansk as a welder in the Rosa Luxemburg Brigade over 30 years ago. In 1953, after she had the temerity to complain that women were given lower financial incentives than men. She was arrested and interrogated for eight hours. In 1968, she protested corruption in government trade unions and was fired. She was later allowed to return to work, but began in the 1970s to agitate for free democratic trade unions. Subjected to constant harassment and intimidation, she endured earning her fellow workers respect. In 1980, working as a crane operator in the Lenin Yard, she fell ill. While she was on leave, she was dismissed. The Yard went on strike in protest, demanding her reinstatement and that of La Lech Walisa, who had also been fired a wage increase, and a promise to build a monument to honor workers killed in the December 1970 strike. Other shipyards struck in sympathy. In two days, the Lenin Yard acceded to its workers' demands, and they prepared to go back to their jobs. But while in Tsinowitz and a young nurse, Alina Piankowska, objected to what they saw as a betrayal of workers at the other yards, whose demands had not been met. They ran back to the hall to stop the return, but the microphones had been turned off. Walentinovitz explains, the shipyard loudspeakers were announcing that the strike was over and everyone had to leave by 6 p.m. The gates were open and people were leaving. Everyone, even Walisa, was willing to go back to work. The two women ran to the main gate, while Lintinowitz called out urging a solidarity strike, reminding the workers that the manager had met their demands only because the other yards were on strike, 
If they were defeated, the linen workers might be too. The tired workers either paid no attention to her or challenged her authority. Tired too, she began to weep. But Alina Pinkowska leaped up on a barrel and cried out, We have to help the others with their strikes because they have helped us. Someone shouted, She's right. Someone else closed the gate. The workers returned to the hall to continue the strike. Out of their negotiations, Solidarity was born in September 1980. In December 1981, the Polish government invoked martial law. Safe in southern Poland, Walentinowicz nevertheless returned to the yard to help organize. The workers erected barricades and set up a hospital. They had no weapons. At six in the morning, ZOMO, the Polish riot police, began to push in. I tried to walk in front of them, but the workers stopped me. They smuggled me out and I stayed in a private flat. But ZOMO found her. She was seized and in prison along with Pinkowska and other leaders. The government held Walentinowicz under cruel conditions, in a men's ward with no privacy, until 1983. Then she was released but forbidden to return to the shipyard. She smuggled herself in and was arrested and sent to a prison hospital for psychiatric observation. They wanted to prove I was insane. Jane Atkinson, interviewing her, asked about a rumor that the government released the women prisoners because they constituted no political threat. Walentinowicz laughed. They always said Alina was a better negotiator with the government because, unlike Lesh, she never compromised and she always got what she wanted. Walentinowicz could not return to work at the yard. Walisa did, got no pension, and lost everything while she was in prison. Her flat was looted. Men took over solidarity. She shrugs. The men are the public speakers. They have the authority and power. It's part of their makeup to feel they are first and they don't want to share it. She was poor and unemployed. Walisa became president of Poland. The men of solidarity did not just appropriate a union while Antenowitz started. They pushed her out of it, impugned her sanity, a common way to attack women, and obliterated her from history. If it were not for Ms. Magazine, we would not know she existed. Yet, this irrepressible woman is now rebelling against Walisa's government. She founded a new labor organization, the Independent Trade Union, and in March 1991, led a strike at the same Gdansk shipyard for higher pay and quicker privatization of the yard. Religious Wars Against Women Although every country erects barriers to women in its economic and political systems, and women's political and economic situation is worse than men's in every country in the world, the figures on political representation cited earlier show improvement over two decades ago before feminism organized women globally. But major international institutions are working to revoke these gains, to return women to a more subordinate and subjugated position. These institutions are religious, the, repo the repositories of many women's trust and faith. All major world religions are patriarchal. They were founded to spread or buttress male supremacy which is why their gods are male. But there is nothing inherently patriarchal about the religious impulse. Religious people define God in their own way, and under pressure from feminism, many churches are trying to eliminate the more egregious patriarchal elements from their symbology. In response to this, other churches have become more rigidly, even fanatically, patriarchal in a movement called fundamentalism. Jewish and Muslim thinkers insist the term fundamentalist does not describe the new movement in Judaism or Islam. 
but journalists tend to call all zealous right-wing religious movements fundamentalist. That outsiders apply the term to groups that share few or no religious principles, but which are all equally ferocious about strong male control over women, indicates they have picked up the subtext of these movements, their real, if tacit, agenda. Writers on fundamentalist sex rarely discuss women, but the only characteristic shared by all religions called fundamentalist is their war to dominate women even more totally. Protestantism. Women were important to the founding and spread of Protestantism. But men seeking power in America found anti-hierarchical Protestantism less attractive once industrial capitalism offered them other paths to power. As men deserted it, Protestantism became largely a church of women. The fundamentalist revivals of both the 19th and 20th centuries were intended to reassert male dominance over the churches and the family and prevent Protestant women from being drawn into the orbit of feminism. But they were mounted under very different, exalted banners. American Protestant fundamentalists claim to uphold the fundamentals of Christianity. They imply that other Protestants have abandoned these tenets. Otherwise, all Protestants would be fundamentalist, and no separate group would adopt the label. A fundamentalist authority, who was Jerry Falwell's mentor, wrote, The fundamentals of the Christian faith include the inspiration and thus the divine authority of the Bible, the deity, virgin birth, blood atonement, bodily resurrection, personal second coming of Christ. The fallen, lost condition of all mankind, salvation by repentance and faith, grace without works, eternal doom and hell of the unconverted, and eternal blessedness of the saved in heaven. These ideas are accepted by Christians who do not consider themselves fundamentalists, but most American Protestant fundamentalists also accept evangelicism. The belief that the Bible was dictated by God and is the highest authority, that eternal salvation was won only by Jesus' atoning for human sin, and that the greatest act of charity is to inform others of this gospel promise of salvation. Thus, fundamentalists are militant, ready to fight for their religion. Whether attacking modernist theology or secular humanism, American Protestant fundamentalists are religious warriors. Combativeness is a characteristic they share with fundamentalist Jews and Muslims. Most fundamentalists also believe in dispensational pre premillennialism. Dispensationalism is the belief that human history is divided into seven ages or dispensations that each ending with dramatic divine intervention and judgment after the human race fails a test from God. The last age will be inaugurated by the return of Jesus, who will establish his kingdom and reign for a thousand years, the millennium, in Jerusalem. Literally, we in the sixth age are about to be destroyed, but believers will be exempted from description by the secret rapture. Dispensationalist, dispensational premillennialism is thus both a council of despair, humans are doomed to destruction, and an exemption from responsibility. The saved are not responsible for the evil of our age, having remained true to fundamentals. They will be saved from destruction. And because fundamentalists are not responsible to society outside their own churches, until very recently, hardcore fundamentalists made separation from mainline denominations a test of faith. 
Any means they use to impose their beliefs is justified. But to get to the heart of fundamentalism, we must leave the exalted realm of abstract, abstract belief and focus on concrete particulars. Fundamentalists are militant about the Bible, doctrine, and daily behavior. They forbid smoking, drinking, dancing, card playing, immodest dress, and any sexual behavior outside marriage. Richard Hofstadter finds them anti-intellectual, paranoid, militant, and oppositionalist, yet devoted to populist democracy. Hofstadter's fundamentalists cannot tolerate ambiguity and are phobic about sexuality. They bar sexual behavior outside marriage and even any verbal reference to sexuality and would like to extend the taboo to the entire society. Psychiatrist Mortimer Osto agrees that fundamentalists are subservient to charismatic, charismatic male leaders and believe women should be segregated from men, assuming their natural state in society and the family. But Ostow feels Hofstadter exaggerates when he describes fundamentalists as having a thoroughgoing fear of normal sex and deviation, because fundamentalists marry and have sex within marriage. But as we shall see, the family is the primary site of female subjection, which is achieved largely through sexuality. Women are indoctrinated into their supposed natural state by male control of the sexuality in the family. To forbid sexual discussion outside the family is to maintain the privacy in which this subjection is imposed. For deeper understanding of fundamentalism's basic agenda, we must turn to a feminist scholar. Betty de Berg, who studied fundamentalism from its late 19th century emergence, asserts that most an analysts of fundamentalism interpret it mainly as an intellectual or theological response to modernist biblical criticism, evolutionary theory, or social science, and that only a few see it as a reaction, only incidentally religious, to significant changes in American society. Theologian H. Richard Niebuhr saw it as a regional southern rural pro protest against urbanization and industrialization. But most scholars today agree that it arose in middle-class white urban culture outside the South. While noting the great social changes that occurred between 1880 and 1930, industrialization, urbanization, immigration, a consumer economy, and World War I, De Berg argues that none of these factors affected as many Americans as intimately and intensely as changes in sex roles in the same period. The men who dominated fundamentalism, and those they appealed to, were living through a revolution that threatened their self-definition as superior by virtue of sex. They were losing control over women. After 1850, as more and more girls were educated and took jobs that expanded their worlds beyond the home, their new economic and social resources placed them to some degree beyond their father's control. Men with less control over fewer children, de Berg remarks, had to depend largely on subordinate wives to reflect their superiority at home. But subordinate wives were getting harder to find Women gained more power within marriage over the century. Acts guaranteeing married women's property rights were passed in many states, and after 1870, a precursor to today's fight for legal abortion emerged, the Voluntary Motherhood Movement. Linda Gordon studied this movement, which was closely associated with the Purity Movement, and because part of the agendas of suffragist moral reform church auxiliary and free love or marriage reform movements became part of the agenda. In an age in which contraception was illegal, the voluntary motherhood movement supported women who tried to control the frequency of sex and stop rape and other sexual abuses within marriage, encouraging them to avoid unwanted pregnancies by asserting control over their own bodies. Daniel Scott Smith considers the movement a major factor in the steady decline of the birth rate throughout the 19th century, despite the in inadequacy or unavailability of artificial contraception and the fact that most American women were married. 
89% to 96% of those over 45. The movement was part of a larger tendency of American women to claim the right to control their own sexuality, whether to avoid pregnancy or to express desire. Statistics show that half of the married women born between 1900 and 1920 and two-thirds of those born between 1910 and 1920 had sexual relations with at least one man before marriage. Okay. Women were claiming the right to control the use of their bodies to the point that many, mainly new women, educated women with careers, refused to marry at all. This was a shocking defiance. In patriarchy, marriage is always compulsory for women. Speaking of a revolt against marriage, Carl Degler es estimates that a quarter of all female college graduates and half the women with doctorates remained single in 1900. Moreover, women who did marry divorced at a startling new rate. Between 1870 and 1930, the U.S. divorce rate jumped fivefold. During the 1920s, two-thirds of divorces were initiated by women. Many observers felt the institution of marriage itself was under attack by feminism. De Berg shows that at the turn of the century, as women moved into independence and rights over their own bodies, fundamentalist rhetoric became obsessed with domestic relations, sexual identity and behavior, and proper gender spheres. A set of books, Fundamentals, published between 1910 and 1913, laid out the basics of the movement, but preachers focused as much on women's behavior as on religious precepts. James H. Brooks, founder of the, millennial, the premillennialist Niagara Conferences, called Elizabeth Cady Stanton's Woman's Bible a miserable abortion, the impudent utterance of infidelity. A popular evangelical preacher gave a sermon, The Choice of a Wife, declaring that any woman who attended lectures like Stanton's was an awful creature, and you had better not come near such a reeking leprous. She needs to be washed, and for three weeks to be soaked in carbolic acid, and for a whole year fumigated before she is fit for decent society. Battle cries for a return to the Victorian ideology of separate spheres flooded popular fundamentalist literature. In 1921, a major fundamentalist journal advertised, wanted more mothers. We are short on homes, real homes. We are short on mothers, real mothers. God designed women as the homemaker, but somehow she seems to have gotten sidetracked. As always, the emancipation of women was equated with the destruction of the family. The fundamentalists knew how to save the family. The church had become too feminized and had to be returned to male control. Men must be in authority in every sphere, they said, and women must suffer subordination within the domestic sphere. There is a full-fledged rebellion underway, not only against the headship of man in government and church, but in the home. Statistics of Yale and Harvard show that women in the better homes are not having children, the average showing less than one child to a family. The cultivation of the modern woman's idea of my individuality is bound to be a destroyer of the home life. With perfect assurance that this was sanctioned by God, these men ordered women to give up ambition and personal well-being for the sake of their families, especially their husbands and brothers. Ministers told women their true mission and fulfillment lay in self-sacrificing service. Women's lot was suffering. One of the great privileges of the Christian life, a female path to emulating Jesus. Women's suffrage would destroy true womanhood and threaten the home, which was sacred. Evangelist Billy Sunday called it the most sacred spot on the globe. They bemoaned that few men attended church and campaigned to attract them, first by diminishing women's influence and power, by impugning the legitimacy of women speaking and holding positions of authority within the church, and second, 
by replacing the feminized rhetoric of Christianity as a church of compassion and nutritiveness with a masculinized language of virility, militarism, and Christian heroism. The King's Business, cited several times above, was published by the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, which, with the Moody Bible Institute, trained women lay ministers and publicly endorsed women's right to speak and teach. All writers and editors of fundamentalist journals, however, opposed ordaining women to traditional parish ministry on the grounds that God's and nature's order would be disrupted if women were given authority over men. But women had been virtually running the churches for nearly a century as men abandoned them. 20th century fundamentalists were far less tolerant of any female leadership in churches than their 19th century counterparts. Yet the religion had not changed. One journal, having already admonished its readers in 1985 to protest whenever an advanced woman attempts a harmful innovation in one of our churches, in 1917 was striking a more strident tone warning that feminism, having wrought such evil in social and domestic life, was now invading the sacred realm of the church. When the Independent Fundamental Churches of America, formerly the American Conference of Undenominational Churches, was founded in 1930, it officially excluded women from membership. In the same year, fundamentalist A.J. Gordon's Gordon College voted to limit, limit when women students to a third of the total. The Moody Bible Institute stopped accepting women in its pastor's class. The last woman graduated from it in 1929. Casting as aspersions on religions in which women were central, theosophy, spiritualism, Christian science, and Pentecostalism, and drumming into their audiences that female authority in churches was illegitimate. Fundamentalists began to campaign to rid the church of Christian symbols and doctrine characterized as passive, soft, creating, um, creating a very chicken-hearted set of people in favor of muscular Christianity. Even male historians note an overwhelming fear of effeminacy and an exaggerated attention to masculinity in the fundamentalism of this period. Seeking to return men into American religious life and reassert male authority in the church, one fundamentalist minister would praise another for being a real man, a manly Methodist, for having fought in a war. The words man, manhood, and masculinity became an obsessive refrain in fundamentalist sermons and writings. Man many attributed the huge popularity of Billy Sunday to his exaggeratedly masculine, I would call it pugnacious, demeanor. He reveled in threatening physical violence, even murder, praying, Lord, save us from off-handed, flabby-cheeked, brittle-boned, weak-kneed, thin-skinned, pliable, plastic, spineless, effeminate, sissified, three-carat Christianity. A male historian feels he spoke intuitively to the deepest confusion of his age and to the realities most troubling his evangelical audiences. Fundamentalists praised their own virility, militancy, militarism, hardness, and inflexibility, seen as elements of control, declaring modernist theologians women, college professors effeminate, sissified, effeminate ginks, and modern theology emasculated Christianity. And conservative evangelicals did draw unusually large numbers of men. Sunday converted more men, especially young men, 
than women. A militaristic morality always creates bigots. Similar values and rhetoric pervaded late 19th century. Uh, where did I am I? And early 20th century European thought, especially in Germany where it nourished the Nazi movement. Fundamentalists also attacked cultural treatments of sexuality, castigating the theater, books, and movies for encouraging social vice and laxity in the observance of the obligations of marriage relations. Film was one of the greatest dangers to public and private morality, fundamentalists said, because theater owners did not attend church, actors were moral degenerates, Movie advertisements offered passion and thrills. Greedy producers produced trash rather than wholesome films. And movie houses were open on Sunday. But the main focus of their attacks was the woeful effects on women. Movies very popular with young women contained influences that would destroy them. Their impure plots familiarize girls with sensual subjects, destroying their proper delicacy, leading them into the peril of present-day freedom. As in Athens, women should not be discussed at all. I think this quote is from, like, Greek stuff? When men begin to regard women as a curious and complex social enigma, they cease to pay her the old-fashioned deference which we like to regard as her unquestioned right. The less woman is considered a question, the surer she will be to fulfill her natural destiny. Fundamentalist propaganda. That might be like the fundamentalist. I don't know. Fundamentalist propaganda especially condemned cultivated Christian women who patronized frivolous and oft times sinful indulgences like theater, cards, gambling, and mainly dancing, which, with its increased modern liberties of personal contact, breaks down personal barriers of safety. Dancing imperiled purity and Christian character because it inflames passion and kindles salacious thoughts. Women's dress was a major theme in fundamentalist sermons in the early 20th century. Ministers found flappers' dresses indecent because their tight skirts did not uphold the nice sense of modesty which is the greatest safeguard of feminine virtue, but rather incited men arousing the passions of the lower nature and causing impure thoughts. Women were responsible for male sexuality. Men are what they are by nature and cannot be blamed for that. In sex and sex alone, they granted women control since women were by nature incarnations of sex. As a minister explained in the word of God on women's dress, <laughs> every man has a quantity of dynamite in him. It did not come to him by cultivation, and it will not leave him by combating. The frequent explosion of that dynamite and its result is a tragic part of the world's history. Many men are made to commit sin in their hearts by the unclothed bodies of women who may be professed Christians and ignorant of the evil they are doing and causing a brother to stumble and become weak. As today's fundamentalists oppose legal abortion, yesterday's fought legalizing birth control on grounds that it was a sin and would destroy the race, the white middle class. It was well known, they argued, that the birth rate was declining faster among native middle class whites than among foreign born black or lower class people. Abortion was also severely condemned, but was not a major theme in popular fundamentalist literature of the period, despite soaring numbers of abortions between 1840 and 1888, performed mainly on married, middle, and upper-class white Protestant women. Fundamentalists regularly blamed modernist theologies 
for modern morality, which they of course found wanting, but for them the word morality was code for traditional sex roles. De Berg's brilliant analysis of fundamentalist positions that seem irrelevant to women, biblical inerrancy and creationism, shows that fundamentalism arose primarily to counter feminism and reassert male control. That's crazy though. I mean, I believe it. That's so crazy. De Berg claims only that it was partly so intended. Oh, uh, still though. No theological position is more closely identified with fundamentalism than biblical inerrancy. The claim that every word of the Bible is absolutely true historically and inspired by God. The Bible was compiled in a period when patriarchy was spreading and its editors altered early materials to eradicate signs of an earlier female dominance and to make male supremacy a divine principle. Like the Iliad and the Aeneid, the Old Testament is a great literature, is great literature. That stresses war male dominance and murder of enemies but enemies always exist more than compassion or tolerance if it is God given and without error then its values also God-given are eternally right. Conservative evangelical Protestants use an inerrant Bible as a major weapon in their war to retain the separate spheres that guarantee male dominance. Finding turn-of-the-century changes in family power structure, a threat to the social order. Fundamentalists attributed them to a loss of faith and the absolute truth of the Bible. They were sure that lower birth rates, read as women's revolt against motherhood, and rapidly rising divorce rates, read as women's revolt against marriage, were inevitable results of a revolt against Paul's teaching in the Bible. Fuck Paul, though. The cure for divorce was the res restoration of the Bible to its proper place. Let the husband and wife realize their God-appointed spheres and duties. Back to the Bible meant back to the home and a God-ordained family. The same subtext underlay creationism, belief in the biblical version of human origins. Fundamentalists abhorred, some still do, the theory of evolution because it offered a scientific explanation for the origins of life. Fundamentalist Minister J.F. Norris told the Texas legislature that evolutionary theory will destroy faith in the Bible by contradicting the account of creation given in Genesis, which was the foundation upon which everything rests. In fact, no religious tenet except male supremacy rests on the Genesis myth. Without explicitly linking evolutionary theory to women's revolt against male supremacy, Norris insisted that the main objective of anti-evolution legislation, barring the teaching of evolutionary theory in public schools, the grounds for the famous Scopes trials, was to defend the Christian home. The home is God's first institution. Let us do all we can to protect that institution, pass laws to protect it, and let none invade its sacred precincts. Fundamentalists also opposed the theory of evolution on grounds that it denied the personhood of the deity, God is a white man, and destroyed morality by degrading human beings to the status of animals or machines, obliterating their responsibility as moral agents. 
evolution they felt precluded the existence of free will and thus moral responsibility. Again, to understand their real message, we have to locate the kind of moral responsibility they had in mind, and of course, it was sexual and gendered. Norris made it explicit. Evolution breeds free loveism. The apes, they never had a marriage license. They change mates frequently. Evolution leads to liberalism of the Sabbath, liberalism of the law, liberalism on love, liberalism on divorce, liberalism on morals, liberalism on doctrine. Fundamentalist morality translated meant almost solely female behavior. Discussion of, the mor of morality treat divorce, crimes committed by women, and girls drinking and smoking. D. Berg concludes that fundamentalists were bothered not by evolution as scientific, philosophical, or theological principle, but by its anticipated effects on the convention, conventions governing family life and sex roles. She believes creationism had a wide appeal because its rhetoric was permeated with arguments supporting Victorian sex roles and domestic conventions arguing that people unable to follow complex intellectual debates on Darwinian theory could understand the significance of changing social mores, their own understanding of who they were as men and as women, and what they were to do. Changes in sex roles underlay their opposition to modernism in general. Christendom was declining into heathenism, because family life was being desecrated. The revolt of youth appalled them, not because youngsters were committing crimes or violence, but because they were abandoning conventional Victorian domestic patterns and sexual mores. Quitting.